The NRA referred to their most avid supporters and activists as hillbillies and fruitcakes during a strategic meeting following the shooting in Columbine. Now, we'll get to that audio in just a moment, but we're learning about these new details after NPR obtained two and a half hours of audio from this meeting that took place immediately after the Columbine shooting in 1999. The tapes were recorded secretly by someone who took part in the meetings, and that individual who wishes to remain anonymous for obvious reasons shared the tapes with NPR. Now we're gonna go through some of the notable moments here, beginning with the main topic of conversation during this strategic meeting, which was in regard to an upcoming conference for the NRA. That conference was to take place about a few days after the Columbine shooting happened. And so, I mean, obviously there were some NRA officials who were concerned, including NRA lobbyist Jim Baker, who was particularly worried about how the optics would be if they went through with that conference. So um, let's hear what he had to say. At the same period where they're gonna be burying these children, we're gonna be having media within 10 miles of our convention center, the world's media, trying to run through the exhibit hall looking at kids fondling firearms, which is gonna be a horrible, horrible, horrible juxtaposition. Now again, that's Jim Baker, he is the NRA lobbyist, and the point he's making is certainly a valid one. But there were members of this meeting who certainly disagreed with him, including Tony Marcus, who is an NRA PR consultant. He said this, that's one very good argument, Jim. On the other side, if you don't appear to be deferential in honoring the dead, you end up being a tremendous S head who wouldn't tuck tail and run, you know? So it's a double edged sword. So the argument here is, uh, I don't know, maybe we should go forward with it because canceling the conference uh, could make it appear as though we feel guilty or claim some responsibility for what happened in Columbine. Cenk. Yeah, uh, the reason that you would feel that way is because it is that way. Um, and uh, so it's not like, they're like, oh, there was a shooting at a school, lots of kids died. So we're going to blame Star Trek. No, they're going to blame the thing that makes sense, which is that the guns killed them. And you encourage kids to have guns. In fact, you saw right there, you heard with your own ears, him saying, if the press comes to our convention, they're gonna see kids fondling guns. He literally said that. Why? Because they know, because they, look, that's their internal meaning. They think nobody's listening. They know they're encouraging kids to get guns. That's why they're so worried. My God, if they find out that we're the ones encouraging this, it's gonna be a problem. But to be fair to the NRA, I gotta say in an emergency situation like that, they did amazing PR and spin control here. And and as you're gonna see here in this story, they got themselves out of it brilliantly from a a political perspective. And it wound up being a thing that they use over and over again to evade responsibility. Now, someone who comes up quite a bit in the reporting here is an NRA strategist by the name of Marion Hammer. And she is, to put it lightly and generously, insane. She's also against canceling the conference. And she makes it clear by stating, you know, You have to go forward for the NRA to scrap this and the amount of money that we have spent. And at that point, she gets interrupted by Wayne LaPierre. And he tries to make a point about how they have meeting insurance. Meaning if they end up canceling the conference, it's okay. The insurance that they have will basically reimburse them for the costs of the event that they're now canceling. And what was fascinating is how she responded to Wayne LaPierre. So in this next clip, it's gonna start with Wayne LaPierre and then you're gonna hear Marion Hammer continue her argument in favor of keeping the conference, not canceling it. Let's listen. We have meeting insurance. I just screw the insurance. The message that it will send is that the, even the NRA was brought to its knees and, and the media will have a field day with it. All right, let me- brought to its knees, the media will have a field day with it. Look, I think that the strategy here is very similar to what we saw from Donald Trump. Refuse to ever take any responsibility, deny, 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 never apologize. 
and just steamroll ahead. And, and that's the strategy that we've seen from the NRA since. And unfortunately, it has worked, it has been successful. And remember, the whole point of that conference is to sell more guns because the NRA is an organization that is heavily funded by gun manufacturers. You know, There is a profit motive behind what's taking place here, despite the amount of people who get shot in, in mass shootings. And also keep in mind that the Columbine shooting, um, which ended up killing 13 people, injuring 20 others, uh, was the first mass shooting since the 1960s. So the country had not yet been as desensitized by mass shootings as it is today. Yeah, this is why I say they were brilliant. And then there's actually a very surprising twist about the gun manufacturers in this story too. And so, but we'll get to that in a second. But the the brilliant part was they decided, no, let's go over the top and let's, Charlton Heston came up with this and, and said it in his speech. Um, let's say, let's blame the other side and say that they're playing politics with kids who have just died. Well, that totally worked. So n- number one, I've seen political polling that shows apologizing moves about three points. So it means that it does no good for you. But what it does with the rest of the folks when you apologize is that it reinforces that you did something wrong. So I don't know that they had access to that polling. They certainly never talked about it in that call. I would be, I know they didn't have access to the polling that I saw, right? But their instinct of not apologizing, unfortunately, in politics is correct. Okay. Now, secondly, when they turned it around and said, you're politicizing it, well, my God, that worked like a charm. Because guys, remember, they're not trying to prove themselves innocent. All they're trying to do is manufacture doubt. And they know with the mainstream media, all you have to do is say anything and they'll turn it into 50 50. So the minute the NRA said, oh, you're politicizing it, the media went, oh, I can't tell. I can't tell who's right or wrong. I can't tell if it's the guns that killed the people or the people politicizing the guns that killed the people. Was it blueberries and Star Trek or was it the guns? I can't tell. And so they've used that strategy now after every mass shooting and it's worked every time. Well, there was another moment during this strategic meeting with NRA officials where they discussed the possibility of providing the victims some sort of fund. Right, Uh, in order to obviously they're doing it for positive PR. Uh, As NPR notes, in those private moments, the NRA considered a strikingly more sympathetic posture toward mass shootings than the uncompromising stance it had taken publicly in the decades since, even considering a $1 million fund to care for the victims. Now, one of the people who was in favor of this is NRA official um, Kane Robinson. He wanted to create this victims fund and the PR consultant, Tony Marcus makes another appearance speaking out against it. Let's listen. Is there something concrete that we can offer? Not because guns are responsible, but because we care about these people. Is there anything, does that look crass or? Like a victims fund. or We create a victims fund and we give a victim a million dollars or something like that. Uh, does that look bad or does it look uh... well? I mean, that can be twisted too. I mean, why why are you giving money? You feel responsible? No, well, you're true. It can be twisted, but we feel sympathetic and uh, respectful. So, in the very end of that clip, you hear Jim Baker again. That's the NRA lobbyist, and he seems to be much more in favor of uh, both canceling the conference, but also providing the victims that one million dollar victims fund. Uh, but the person who seems to be, two people seem to be the most outspoken against uh, doing anything that uh, seems to either apologize or take any responsibility. It's the PR consultant, Tony Marcus, and also the NRA strategist, uh, Marion Hammer, who will uh, make another appearance later in this segment. But uh, in regard to Robinson, um, Kane Robinson, who wanted the Victims Fund, you can also hear him in the audio saying this. Don't anybody kid yourselves about this great macho thing of going down there and showing our chest and showing how damn tough we are. We are in deep crap on this deal. And so anything we do here is going to be a matter of trying to decide the best of a whole bunch of very, very bad choices. 
And again, we know which direction they went in. Um, obviously, do not apologize, do not take responsibility, steamroll ahead. Um, and so any thoughts on that, Jake, before we move on to uh, Marion Hammer's comments on NRA activists? Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to them insulting their own activists so you know what they actually think of you. Uh, but um, I also, again, want to say their views on Congress and gun manufacturers are super relevant, so keep going. All right, so we're gonna get to their views on Congress in just a moment. But here's Marion Hammer, the NRA strategist, essentially telling the world or in this private meeting, telling them what she genuinely thinks about the most avid NRA supporters and activists. If you pull down the exhibit hall, that's not gonna leave anything for the media except the members meeting. And you're gonna have the wackos with all kinds of crazy, resolutions with all kinds of, of dressing like a bunch of hillbillies and idiots and and it's gonna it's gonna be the worst thing you can imagine. Mm. I yeah. didn't say it. She said it. Yeah, so look, that's what they think of you. If you're an NRA member, uh, the elites in the NRA think you're wackos and hillbillies and idiots. You know, sometimes right wing catches massive feelings when we call them idiots. But it turns out your own leaders think you're idiots. And that's 10,000 times worse because we're fighting against you guys. Whereas they're tricking you. They think, oh, these guys lead to good profits, get a bunch of wacko hillbillies in here, we'll sell them a lot of weapons, they'll die, but who cares, right? Um, and and so now you know what they think privately. Is it gonna change your mind? No, you're gonna listen to a right wing media show. You're gonna get brainwashed into thinking guns are awesome and that they protect you. And then, uh, you know, and then unfortunately for some of you, that'll be your demise. And then finally, let's talk about Congress because uh, the system of legalized bribery has been a problem for quite some time. Uh, lobbying has been a problem for quite some time. And the NRA has exploited that system for its own benefit. So uh, here's what their discussion regarding Congress uh, sounded like. Uh, they discussed conservative politicians and gun industry representatives as largely inconsequential players saying they will do whatever the NRA proposes. Members of Congress, one participant says, have asked the NRA to quote, secretly provide them with talking points, end quote. And so look, hmm. obviously none of that is surprising to us. We see how the sausage is made day in, day out. But it is very nice to see them admit it on tape for what, like the billionth time. I mean, this is a different context with different players, but how many videos or how many, how much tape have we shown this year alone involving lobbyists for massive corporations indicating that they're just buying politicians left and right. It's just the most obvious thing in the world. Yeah, so uh, first of all, on Congress, uh, this is classic Washington. So even back then, 1999, uh, he, the NRA basically lobbyists saying, "Oh, don't worry about the Congress members; they're puppets. They're puppets." Okay, and so the idiots are panicking. They come to us, and then we give them talking points, and then they're happy. They talk about Tancredo. They talk about senators. They name specific people who called who are in a panic. And they say, "Oh, don't worry, we're gonna give you schmucks your talking points and your stupid checks. They didn't mention the checks and the calls, but that's obvious and implied, okay? And uh, and then you'll do as you're told. So all these, by the way, again, I blame the mainstream media in this case because they treat the politicians with such reverence. Like, what does the senator from Oklahoma think? He doesn't think a damn thing. He's waiting for the NRA lobbyists to tell him what to say because he's a stupid puppet, okay? Don't have any respect for these uh, elites in Washington. So now look, but in a sense, you also see here the NRA leaders are kind of directing traffic, right? Hey, we got it, and they think everybody's idiots on their own side, right? We got to use the useful idiots who are the guys who buy the guns, and we have to have our puppet idiots who we control in Congress. Uh, and but now the NRA is a lot more radical. Then even those tapes indicate, so what happened? I think there was some degree of audience capture. Just like there is today in, in social media with online hosts. Um, I think that those guys that they called wackos and hillbillies were such an important customer base. They kept appealing to them, 
and they became more and more radical over the years until they became the wacko hillbillies. And so now they, I mean, they say outrageous things after mass shootings. And and they blame, they're not just manufacturing doubt anymore, they're aggressively turning around and blaming the people who are actually trying to solve it and saying that it's their problem. And then finally, the gun manufacturer part was also interesting because in the, in parts of the tapes, it seems like the gun manufacturers are not that important to the guys at the NRA. Like the members of Congress, they treat them like, oh, we'll tell them what to say. And I was surprised by that because I would think that the gun manufacturers are the ones that are paying them. And hence, they would have more power. But later in the tapes, you see that it's the gun manufacturers basically asking them, like, what should be our talking points? So then you realize, oh, the NRA is just the marketing arm for those gun manufacturers. So the gun manufacturers are almost calling their employees and saying, hey, how do we market our way out of this so we can sell more guns to the wackos and hillbillies? And the NRA is here to please. Those masters. Thanks for watching The Young Turks. I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all of that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.